We are right in the season of Advent. Advent Advent means arriving. And uh, Christians right across the world are considering and thinking and reflecting and remembering about what it means and the significance of the arrival of Jesus, born to be king as a baby. And so we are continuing this series, Peace on Earth. And this is number three. And uh, I trust that it's been really powerful for you as you've been thinking about what does peace look like in your life, in our world, in our hearts. And so if you're here with us in the room or you're watching on uh, Channel 44, I trust that you lean in to what God wants to say to us this morning. I wanted to share with you an article from Eternity News, which uh, was actually uh, put in that uh, online publication in 2016 about this lady. And I want you to have a look at the picture of her up on the screen. Her name is Dina Catanacho. I might not have pronounced that correctly. (laughs) But she is the director of the Arab-Israeli Bible Society based in Nazareth. And uh, the reason I want to talk about her is because I read an article about a really innovative idea that she had that is bringing real peace into children's lives traumatised by war. Children in Israel and the Palestinian territories are going to sleep with a book of Bible stories about peace under their pillows. The colourful picture book in Arabic containing 15 biblical stories, 15 stories of contemporary children questions and prayer is shaping the attitudes of the next generation. She says in a video interview that instead of a war mentality, she wants to encourage and grow in the next generation a peace mentality, how they can be initiators and be used by God to be bringers of peace. As director of the Arab-Israeli Bible Society since 2008, Dina ministers to a culturally Palestinian community of Christians of all denominations who number about 1.7 million or 20% of the Israeli population. She works in unity with two other Bible societies serving the Israeli and Palestinian communities in Israel. And she says she was inspired to produce this children's peace Bible during the war between Gaza and Israel in 2014 when she was heartbroken by the scenes of pain and agony that she saw on TV. Having lived through the violence of six wars, not just one, six, (laughs) and facing daily prejudice and oppression, Dina saw an urgent need for healing between the Arab and Jewish communities through the power of God's word. She recalls a two-month period during the Gaza War where she didn't allow her three sons to play outside because there'd been kidnappings of children on both sides of the conflict. And during that period, she would even hesitate to speak her own Arabic language for fear of endangering her life. And she wouldn't visit a shopping mall where Jews and Arabs shopped together. But God showed her he could still do wonderful things even in such times. Having been tempted to cancel an Alpha course in Jerusalem because it was endangering her life on travelling on the road, she decided to go ahead anyway and was surprised and delighted when three women came to faith during the course. And she says this quote in a video interview I watched of her and she says, you know, to, to hate someone who loves you is evil. To love someone who loves you is human. But to love someone who hates you, that is divine. To be able to have the capacity, not of yourself, but to draw on a divine power source, to love someone who is your enemy, can only be the love of Christ flowing through us. That doesn't come naturally to us as human beings. And she says, in the midst of conflict, that God is giving them an opportunity to practice their love muscles. <laughs> I love that. Because don't you reckon he still gives us those kinds of opportunities every day <laughs> with people in our life? You know, you might not be facing a war, but you might be facing turmoil and tension and heartache in your marriage, in your family, on your street, <laughs> in your workplace, 
You know, there can be relational tension that causes so much stress, especially in the lead up to the Christmas season. And she says, God is still at work in community like ours. And I feel that the Holy Spirit wants to say to us today that God is still at work in his church and through his people to be bringers of peace. Jesus is well able to help us practice our love muscles and grow our love muscles to follow his example and draw from him the enabling power that we need to love the people that we find it hardest to love, our enemies. People who might have something against us or relentlessly are giving us a hard time. You see, peace is not some elusive ideal. It's not simply warm, fuzzy feelings or an agreed ceasefire to ongoing relational tensions. It's not so we can just eat turkey and fruit mince pies and play happy families at Christmas time. That's not actually real and lasting peace. Peace sometimes requires far more than we have to give. Peace is actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We need to go to our divine power source and draw from Him to be a bringer of peace. And this fruit of the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Galatians 5.22, love and joy and peace. It's something that Christ produces in us as we look to Him and trust Him and ask Him to help us. And when our lives and character increasingly bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we demonstrate where Jesus is at work in our life. When we lay down our agenda and we listen to His Word, we are cooperating with His Spirit. As we invite the Holy Spirit to help us obey His Word, we become more and more like Him. And as we become more and more like Him, we are continually led by His Spirit to lay down our agenda. It's like this beautiful cycle of growth that happens. To lay down our hurts and our frustrations and be bringers of peace. I serve at our local church here at Seton with Milan Tompich, who is our general manager. But I'm going to put my daughter-in-law hat on for a minute because he's also my father-in-law. And I have seen Milan walk out this thing of being a peacemaker in his own life. About five years before I got married to my husband, Michael, Milan's son, (laughs) um, he, Milan and his dad had a disagreement. There were some boundaries that Milan needed to set and then his dad decided not to speak to him. And as much as Milan would try to resolve the issue, there was this wedge So much so that even though he was invited and we would have loved him to come, he didn't, Milan's dad, Frank, who's now with Jesus in heaven, he didn't come to Michael and my wedding. Like, so he missed out on some stuff, some really powerful stuff. And I have just watched Milan year after year after year sow seeds of peace to pray, (laughs) to keep inviting, to not give up. And so about five years ago, uh, they were able to just draw a line under the sand and come back into relationship. And I saw Milan inviting Frank along to family functions and he got to know his great grandchildren. So much so that Milan and his wife Aileen and his sister Nada and Mark looked after Frank very much so when he was in a nursing home. Every day he would visit him and bless him and serve his dad. So much so that I, Milan stood up this year at his dad's funeral and testified to the strengths and why he was grateful for his dad who had lived a very hard life. And I just think that is amazing to be someone who, because of the divine power of Christ that work in our life, that we would be a bringer of peace to lay down our frustrations and our hurt and extend a hand even when it gets slapped down to keep extending a hand that is evidence of the holy spirit at work in our lives don't you reckon maybe you didn't know that about milan (laughs) but biblical peace is not just about ending conflict peace is about restoring what is broken bringing wholeness and unity and setting things Right, and maybe me telling that story has sparked something in you because maybe you don't have a talking 
relationship with someone in your family right now? I don't know. And I'm not talking about being a doormat. I'm not talking about putting yourself back in an abusive situation. But maybe the Holy Spirit wants to give you an idea today how you can be a peacemaker. John 3.16 is a famous promise from the Bible. We heard about it in the opening video before I started to share. But I believe John 3.17 is just as powerful. It captures the essence of God's heart and his desire and his ability to bring peace. It says in John 3.17 in the message paraphrase, God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. And so first and foremost, peace is actually a person. Peace is a person and his name is Jesus. And Jesus, the name of Jesus means God saves. Do you know, in this Advent season, I have been watching a couple of, or some short devotional videos by a lady called Dr. Amy Orr Irwin. She's the president of the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. Pretty smart lady. She's just been sharing via video blog just a few thoughts around anticipating and what it means, the significance of Christ's coming. Through Advent, the lead up to Christmas, we remember that God came as a person in Jesus. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born to a teenage girl engaged to be married but still a virgin. And Joseph, Jesus' earthly dad, had to be persuaded (laughs) that his future wife had not slept with anyone and been unfaithful to him and that this baby was a conception of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, Joseph understood the birds and the bees. He understood how babies happen, right? And so he had to be persuaded. He didn't think when Mary told him when she was pregnant, oh, God must have done that. But the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream And it was only when he had this visit that he believed Jesus was God in the flesh and that this baby was something astonishingly special. And the angel reassured him in Matthew 1, verse 20 to 21, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And I don't know what you think about when you hear the word sin. It's not a very popular word today. But as I was watching one of these devotional videos by Dr. Er Orwing, I was reminded about how it's so important to understand why the Bible talks about sin and what it is. The first picture that the Bible gives us about sin to help us understand what it actually is, is something that's called missing the mark. It's a picture of an archer trying to hit a target with a bow and arrow and to sin is to miss the mark, it's to miss the bullseye. And all of us experience this. Despite our best efforts and our best intentions, we cannot hit perfection. We cannot hit the mark, we fall short, we miss the mark. And so this is one aspect of what sin is. Another picture the Bible gives us is about crossing the line. Crossing the line. The King's James Version talks about the word transgression, uses the word transgression. This is when we know something to be wrong and to cross over that line and still choose to do it. That's another way we sin sometimes. The third way the Bible talks about sin is to ignore the maker's instructions where we carry on in our lives as if there is no God, as if there is no creator, and his will doesn't really matter. And if we're all honest, really honest, (laughs) we've all struggled with sin in these three ways. It's the common condition of humanity. The good news is that this baby who arrived at the very first Christmas would go up to save us from our sins. That Jesus is God come in human flesh to put the world right again. 
to restore our broken relationship with God, which was broken because a holy God cannot have relationship with sinful humanity. But Jesus, on that cross, he took our sins upon himself. He was crucified and he took God's anger and the punishment for our wrongdoing in our place. He died. He was buried. But like we sang about this morning, after three days, he rose again from the dead. He is actually alive. He's a real person. He's God come. (laughs) And he sent his Holy Spirit. He rose back to be with the Father. He sent his Holy Spirit and he's here right now by his Spirit, saying and reminding us that this is all true. In Ephesians 2, 13 to 14, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Isn't that beautiful? He himself is our peace. He himself. Peace is a person and his name is Jesus. God saves. And so when you think of peace, you can picture a cross. And the vertical line that you see on that cross is what is available to us because of Jesus. And what is available to us is an unbreakable spiritual union with God as our heavenly Father that can never be snatched, that can never be stolen, that can never be broken. Because Jesus has opened up a new and living way for us to know God as Father. In Colossians 1, verse 21 to 23, it says, Once you were alienated from God and were his enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now (laughs) he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. And I believe that's a word for some of us here today. Don't shift from this. Don't let the enemy give you a hard time and point the finger and accuse you. This unbreakable spiritual union with God as your heavenly Father will always be true forever and forever. You are going to be known as His beloved child because of Jesus. You are holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. There is forgiveness for sins in Jesus. In Hebrews 9, it says, For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like a high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place in Jewish um, customs before Christ came, year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, He has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by His own death as a sacrifice. There was an event over 2,000 years ago. And because of that one single event, if we believe upon Him and received what He's done for us, then our current reality is that we know God in this unbreakable relationship, unbreakable spiritual union forever and forever and forever. And we have eternal life with Him. Come on, 10.30 crowd, this is amazing. (laughs) his undeserved kindness is now your current reality forever because Jesus made peace with God possible your continual and constant position in God's family is beloved child that's amazing At the very first Christmas, the multitude of angels announced to the stinky, undeserving, ordinary, rough and tough shepherds Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace on whom his favour rests. If you are in Christ, his favour rests on you. It doesn't depart from you. You have it. You don't have to plead for it. It's yours. The one who came to make peace possible is finally here. 
and he would grow up to save people from their sins. In Romans 5, 1 to 2, Therefore, since we have been, have been, it's past tense, we have been justified, that is acquitted of sin, declared blameless before God by faith, let us grasp the fact that we have current reality. We have peace with God and the joy of reconciliation with Him through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. Through Him, we also have current reality, access by faith into this remarkable state of grace in which we firmly and safely and securely stand. Let us rejoice in our hope and the confident assurance of experiencing and enjoying the glory of our great God, the manifestation of his excellence and his power. Past event, current reality. It can be your current reality. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you can receive him and believe upon him today. He will come into your life and you can know God as your heavenly father. You are in this remarkable state of grace. You are sustained by this beautiful grace. You can rejoice in the hope and the confident assurance of experience and enjoying God himself. <laughs> you can expect his goodness, his grace and his power to be constantly at work in your life as you trust in Jesus. I really feel today that some of you have given up hope for people in your life or even in your own life. You feel like I'm too far gone or they're too far gone. Well, God's word to you today is, he loves you. He's for you. He's given His Son for you and you can know Him and walk in His favour. When you look at a cross, we talked about the vertical line and you see a horizontal line. This is a, can we put that pic back on the screen, guys? This is a reminder to us that we can reach out to others even our enemies, and be souls of peace. If we've received this wonderful free gift of grace, this unbreakable union with God as a heavenly Father because of Jesus, we can now reach out to others and be bringers of peace. I said right at the start that peace sometimes requires far more than we have to give. But if we go to our divine source, because when we come to Christ, His Spirit comes to live in us. When we go to our divine source, we can draw from Him all that we need to be a bringer of peace. I don't know if you know the history of the hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles in Jesus' time. A Jew was anyone who belonged to one of the 12 tribes of Israel through birth lineage and a Gentile was everyone else. And so as used in the Gospels, Gentile simply means non-Jewish. The differences between Jews and Gentiles were vast and could be seen in what they ate, how they dressed, how they washed, how they worshipped, what their art, academics, language and social customs looked like. Even their architecture was different. Jews believe in one transcendent God who created the universe and everything in it. And the Bible describes them as God's chosen people from which the Messiah, the anointed one, was promised to come. To Jewish people at that time, Gentiles or outsiders represented all that was impure, all that was decadent, all that was sinful, and certainly all that was not Jewish. Many Jews viewed Gentiles with disdain, labelling them as unclean and sinful. On the flip side, the Hellenistic culture of that time was more of a free-for-all, Greek and Roman mythology, morality, philosophy and politics, anything goes. <laughs> And Gentiles resented Jews' exclusive claims. There were many lies and false beliefs circulated about Jewish people at the time of Jesus because of their customs that separated them from the rest of the nations. And God intended for his people to be a light to the nations, that through them all nations would be blessed. But by the time we get to Jesus' time, they settled down into the national... Uh, psyche or the national understanding a sense of superiority theologian John Stott gives us a picture of the levels of hostility between Jews and Gentiles the tragedy is that Israel forgot her vocation her calling twisted her privilege into favoritism and ended by heartily despising even detesting Gentiles 
the heathen, they called them dogs. William Barclay helps us feel the alienation between the two communities and the deep-seated hostility between them, especially on the Jewish side. He writes, the Jew had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles said the Jews were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. Can you believe that? God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations he had made. That was a distorted picture of what God had intended. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need, for that would simply be to bring another Gentile into the world. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. You can understand why for Peter it was a massive shift <laughs> that God had to break into his world with this vision of a, of a sheep coming down with unclean, what well, he saw as unclean animals, eat, you know, go and eat. You know, he had to break into his, his, underst- his fundamental understanding of how the world worked. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. In the Jerusalem temple, the outer Gentile court was down low, right down low. There were steps leading up to different levels of this court, right down low. There were signs put up that would prohibited people to go beyond this point with the threat of death if they stepped over that line. And so when Paul writes of what God did in Christ, he speaks about there was this dividing wall in the outer court, the Gentile court of the temple. He speaks about this dividing wall of hostility being broken down in Christ. Have a listen to this. In Ephesians 2, it says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, (laughs) in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in His flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Jesus took upon Himself and fulfilled the law. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. That's his church. Thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Wow. Paul is saying Christ has not only won for us peace with God, peace is not only made possible, but his purpose is for Jesus to bring peace, to bring reconciliation between people. If God can do such a remarkable thing as create in Himself this one new humanity through His church with this massive cultural systemic hostility that was there between the Jews and the Gentiles, what can He do in your life and in the lives of the people that you care about? What can He do? (laughs) And some of you have given up hope maybe to pray for peace for someone in your family. You just think, you know what? They're just always causing division. They're always causing hostility. I'm not even, I don't even think God can touch their hearts anymore. And He's saying to you today, yes, He can. Yes, He can. If He can touch the heart of Jews who so disregarded people, He can touch anyone's heart. And He is wanting to Tell us, church family, to be peacemakers, to be peacemakers in our family, to be peacemakers in our school, to be peacemakers in our communities, to be peacemakers in our street and our workplaces. I talked about Milan, another person in my family who I've seen be a peacemaker is my stepmom, Judy. She went through a divorce and it was really painful what happened but time and time again I've seen her sow seeds of peace her ex-husband and his girlfriend were invited to her wedding to my dad but it's been a work of the spirit to bring her to a point of forgiveness 
and to reach out and keep sowing and keep praying and say, you know what? There is not going to be the enemy's wedge in this family. No way. I'm going to stand up and pray peace. I'm going to stand up and minister peace. I'm going to let the Lord do a work in my heart of forgiveness so I can genuinely love someone who is so hard for me initially to love. Where do you need his peace to be at work in your relationships right now? Philippians 2.13 says, God is working in you to give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And if we can't see his heart is peace, (laughs) if we can't see what pleases him is to be peacemakers that runs all through the scripture, it's what Jesus did on the cross. How is he asking you to cooperate with him and draw the strength you need from him to be a peacemaker? You might be saying, I don't even know where to start. Well, ask him for his help for starters. God, I can't do this. I need a power source that's bigger and greater than me. <laughs> Fill me with your love. Maybe it's help me to forgive. I choose to forgive. It starts with asking Jesus for help, talking to him in prayer, but practically, do you know being a peacemaker often looks like sowing seeds? You might reach out a hand and it gets slapped down, but you keep reaching out your hand. Being a peacemaker often looks like sowing seeds. It looks insignificant. It looks small. It's acts of kindness. It's taking, being led of the Holy Spirit to, to move towards people when you don't want to. And James 3 is a great way to evaluate where godly wisdom and peace is at work in relationships and also to discern the opposite. <laughs> Where selfish ambition and envy and even demonic powers at work trying to drive wedges in relationships. Both in our own hearts and in the reactions and the attitudes and behaviours of others. Have a look at this in James 3. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show up by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And this is for some of us today. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I've seen it in Milan's life. I've seen it in my stepmom's life. She's loved by her extended family. She's loved by her ex-family. She's just sown seeds of peace. <laughs> Where is he calling you to be sow seeds of peace? To o- not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. John Stott says, wherever we proclaim peace, it is Christ who proclaims it through us. Because he's actually the one who's got us to that point of saying peace. The last bit of Ephesians 2 says, He came, Jesus, and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. That's, that was Jesus' mission. Those who thought they were insiders and those who knew they were outsiders, he said, peace. Peace. The first words out of his mouth to his disciples were, Peace be with you. As the Father's sending me, I'm sending you. You need my spirit to help you. <laughs> Why don't we pray together, hey? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the reminder that you yourself are our peace, Lord Jesus. That you've made it possible for us to have peace with God. 
It wasn't an easy thing for you to go to the cross, but you did it because you love us. Because you wanted us to come into that unbreakable spiritual relationship with God as our Heavenly Father. For those of us who know you like that, we say thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, the first prayer that I ever prayed was, God, if you're real, show me. He can work with that. (laughs) But if you're at a point where you're ready to say, you know what, I've heard about what Jesus did for me today. I want to give my life completely to him. I want to say, come into my life and leave me. Lead me. Forgive me. I want to follow him. You can do that right now. You just, like, you, like I'm talking to you, you can just talk to him in your heart. If you mean it with all of your heart, he'll hear it and he'll come in. If you're wanting to pray that prayer, I'm just going to say a prayer and you can wrap your heart around the words and say it too. God, I didn't actually think that you were real. (laughs) But from what I've heard today, I know that you came in person as a baby and you grew up to die on a cross for me. And I'm actually a bit overwhelmed by that. I don't want to say thank you for doing it because I need saving. I know my sins have separated me from you, but I need saving. And I thank you, Jesus, that you came to save me. I receive your forgiveness. I ask you to lead me. Help me to live for you. Help me to have a new power source on the inside. Thank you that when you come in, you change my heart. So I want to love and do the things that you love and do promised always to be with me. Help me, Jesus, to follow you. Amen. If you prayed those words, it's not so much about the words, but if you meant it with all your heart, you are now my brother or my sister. You're a child of God. You come into his family and he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Can we stand together? I just want you to have a think about if there's someone or a relationship where you need the peace of God to work. Or if God's spoken to you today and He says, I want you to be a peacemaker. Just maybe close your eyes right across this room. Just have a moment where you surrender to Him about that. You say, God, help me. I'm sorry for giving up hope for that person. No one and nothing is too hard for you. I speak peace. The peace of God, peace with you and peace with other people into their life. Fill me up with your spirit and help me. Help me, Jesus, to be a peacemaker. Help me to listen to your voice, listen to your word, to be led by your spirit, to sow seeds of peace, no matter how insignificant they feel. Help me, Jesus. Empower me. Strengthen me. I thank you that as I follow you in this, that there will be a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of righteousness in my family, in my life and in their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Why don't we join in continuing to just let the Lord speak to us and respond to Him as we sing this song.